So hello again. This is the Classics of Immunology Journal Club. And now we're already up to 1982 today that we're going to discuss a, one of my own papers that I'll tell you about. But before we get started, uh, don't forget to uh, go on the YouTube uh, channel and, and like the video and um, click on the bell to get notified for the, for the next go around. And also scroll down and check out my website and look on the writing tab because that's where you'll find all of the classic papers of immunology. So you don't have to take my word for it. Yeah, you, know, you can read them yourself. And, um, and also there's a, the other, the other things are my social, social media things in particular, Twitter. And I have some paintings you might like, say I have these paintings behind me. This is my old mentor, Georges Maté right here, uh, that you might enjoy. Today, we're going to uh, do a paper or entitled a monoclonal antibody that appears to recognize the receptor for T-cell growth factor uh, partial characterization of the receptor. It was published in Nature in November of 1982. And the authors of this paper were uh, Warren Leonard, Joel Depper, Takashi Uchiyama, myself, Thomas Waldman, and Warner Green. And so the background on this paper is that um, Warren Leonard and, De and Depper and Uchiyama and Green were all postdocs, and Waldman was the leader of their lab. And then I was the leader of my lab. And so it's of interest, just for the record, that the Waldman allowed Warner Green to become the senior author on this paper. And the other principal person involved, I think, in all the experiments was Warren Leonard, who was first author. Takashi Uchiyama is interesting because he's the one that made the monoclonal antibody that this paper is all about. And he he made that one. He, he's He's from Kyoto, and he was a postdoc with Tom Waldman. And um, the project that he worked on was trying to make T-cell-specific uh, monoclonal antibody that would recognize um, T-leukemia cells. And he happened to, to immunize mice. He must have tried other ones. I didn't ask him about that. But he used a cell line that we discussed last week, the so-called HUT-102 cell line. And this this cell line is of interest to TCGF and you know, looking two kinds of uh, people because, as this paper describes, it had a whole lot of T TCGF receptors. It was isolated from a patient that they thought had cutaneous T cell lymphoma, which is what's also called because it was a cutaneous lymphoma. Mycosis fungoides was another name for it, or was the was the original name back in the day. Uh, because they would get funny looking skin lesions on, on their skin, which were the malignant T cells. And it looked like a fungal infection. It's grossly and also microscopically had all these lymphocytes in there. And, and so they, called, they thought it was a fungal infection. So that's why they call it mycosis fungoides. Um, it turns out it wasn't a fungal infection. And it wasn't a um, cutaneous T cell lymphoma of this patient that I have that where this cell line came from. It was an acute T cell leukemia, ATL, which turns out was endemic in Japan. About one of the, Japan and, and the Caribbean are the only places in the world where you saw adult T cell leukemia. Most of the acute leukemias <clears throat> were coming from children either, and most of them were B cell leukemias. Uh, so, so this was an unusual thing. It turns out the Washington VA hospital <clears throat> had a lot of these kinds of patients and they, they're the ones that started the cell line. And um, the head of the, of the lab in, in the, at the VA hospital was friends with Bob Gallo. And he sent Bob Gallo cells from his, from his patients. And that's how this, these cell lines were actually, I think they started them at the Washington VA and then he gave them to Bob Gallo to see whether or not he could find um, retrovirus um, in these different kinds of uh, cells. So Takashi Uchiyama is interesting because I met him over in Japan for the first time and he, and maybe it was afterwards I had, I had first met him uh, that he, he told me, so they, they named this, they had a name for this antibody and, it, and they called, called it anti-TAC, T-A-C. TAC was ostensibly um, meant to, to say it was activated T cells that this antibody was specific for. But Takashi, who was a very uh, modest and humble Japanese guy, he's a very nice person. And then he said, Kendall, he said, it's not activated T cells. They, we named that for Takashi. 
<laughs> which is what his name was, is. Um, and I always was amused by that. I thought that was great. And the story about this, uh, the backstory on this uh, whole paper and, 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 and so forth, is, is that um, we published the paper that I reviewed last week uh, the, on the TCGF receptors um, assay in the fall of 1981. I think it was October, November. And in January, I got a phone call from Tom Waldman in his lab saying that they thought they might have an antibody that was reactive to the, to the receptor. And they wanted me to send them some radio labeled IL-2 so they could see whether or not the antibody blocked the, um, the binding. And I don't know if you, if you paid attention last week, the, the binding assay was, was you just couldn't sort of do that on them. You needed to really pay attention to exactly how that whole thing was put together and, and so forth. And it was a little bit involved. And so I tried to explain them that, and they didn't want to hear that. They kept saying, you know, but we could do the experiment right away if you just send us some radio labeled IL-2. And, and so I finally said, well, why don't I just come down there and, um, and talk to you guys and see what, see what you got and, and whatever. And so they said, fine. So I got on the plane from Hanover, New Hampshire, and I flew down to Bethesda and I went to talk to them. And um, we were all sitting in Tom Oldman's office and we were going over things and they kept still wanting, wanting me to give them radio labeled IL-2. And I kept telling them that they, why don't they give me a little bit of their antibody and I'll do the experiment. So finally, this went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally, Waldman stood up, left the room, didn't say what any, where he was going or whatever. He came back with a styrofoam box and he put it down on the table and that was the end of the meeting. <laughs> he was giving me, so he, so it was a tiny little Eppendorf tube in, the, in this great big styrofoam box with a bunch of dry ice. And that was, a, that was the antibody that they gave me. I took the antibody home. And, um, and um, the very first experiment, uh, it, it worked like a charm. And I'll show you the data on that. So that's, that's the story. In the introduction of this paper, they, they basically summarized the TCGF receptor data from, from our paper from 1981. And with the idea that there is this T cell growth factor on the one hand, and it made T cells proliferate, and that there was, there was a TCGF receptor that had been, been detected by this binding assay. Um, and, and so that was what was known. And so they did, they, they also knew from their initial experiments I forgot to say, well, I forgot to say that. And this is what they, they, they say in their introduction is, is that when Takashi got his ant, so he immunized, immunized mice with these HUT-102 cells and selected out for antibodies that would react to, to bind to the HUT-102 cells. And this, this antibody was one of them. And um, when, they, when they looked at normal T cells, they, they, it was negative. And however, if they looked at activated PHA or MLC activated T cells, it was positive. And so that's why they thought they then went on and they showed that their antibody would block PHA and, and MLC generated um, lymphocyte proliferation. So that's why they thought, aha, this is, this is to the TCGF receptor. So, um, they then, in, in the materials and methods of this paper that they go into next, in order for their antibody, they used two different sources of their antibody. They used acidic fluid from mice that had been um, given the, the hybridoma cells into the peritoneal cavity, and then it would secrete large amounts of, of the antibody that they could then use um, as a crude preparation, but they also then purified the antibody with a, with a protein acephalose column, which was better because then you didn't, you couldn't worry that there were non-antibody things in the acidic fluid that might be positive in their assays. They used two different um, cell lines. One they want, its name was CTC2, and the other one was HUT-102. Both of these cell lines would proliferate 
uh, with were TCGF dependent cell lines proliferating, which was very unusual, if, if you recall, from um, some of the last other uh, experiments that we've reviewed. Um, HUT-102 was also super in, unusual because the um, Gallows lab had done experiments to show that, the, that HUT-102 also produced IL-2. So it was proliferating in response to the, to the um, TCGF that it, it itself was producing. CTC, you needed to give it from with exogenously from without. And phenotypically, they, they, they typed all their cells. They were all uh, sheep, red cell, red blood cell rosette positive. So that was the, the traditional marker for human T cells. They were CD3 positive, and we talked about CD3 um, with Alice Reinhardt's experiments that were published in 1980. So now we had an, and that was a monoclonal antibody marker now that was specific for T cells, human T cells. And they were surface immunoglobulin negative, so that they, and they were Epstein Barr virus negative, so they weren't B cells. These, these were T cells. Um, so now I I'll show you the, uh, the, uh, the figure from the first uh, paper and we'll do some screen sharing. Okay, so this is figure one. And in this figure on the, in the left-hand pa uh, panel, panel A, we have percent inhibition of thymidine incorporation into the, into the um, CTC cell line. And we've got in the solid circles, anti-TAC uh, ascites, and as we go in, in increasing amounts of, of the acidic fluid, we're getting up to around 85% uh, inhibition of the uh, proliferation of, of this particular cell line. And a, a, an anti-IA antibody was basically their control, and it was negative, uh, control ascites. And then on the B side, now we have the use of the purified antibody in micrograms, and you get exactly the same kind of a profile here. So this is the purified antibody in the solid circles and the uh, purified anti-IA or MHC class two antibody in the open circles. So then in the, so then in figure two is the experiment that, that actually I did, I drew the figure and um, did the experiments and then drew the figure. And this is um, percent inhibition on the um, y-axis of tritiated TCGF binding. And it's the same sort of thing. It goes up increased inhibition is what we're looking at. I would have plotted it. I think I plotted it the other way. It would have gone down with increasing antibody concentrations. But anyway, the solid circles are at 37 degrees and the open circles um, are at four degrees. And then the control here, anti-IA is at 37 degrees. Now, if we go over to the, this slide, so in um, figure three, we have, this is an SDS uh, polyacrylamide gel of S35 labeled, internally labeled HUT-102 B cells precipitated with, with cold anti-TAC. And so these are the molecular weight markers um, uh, here. And this is what they were able to find here. They had a major band somewhere between say 47,000 and 53,000. And then I, you can't even really discern it, but there was a faint band here at about twice the molecular weight. And then another one about four times, P180 is what they called it. And um, so they thought that what they were dealing with, they didn't know what these two things were, but they thought what they were dealing with primarily was a single protein um, that had a molecular size of around 50,000 Daltons. So then they went on to, to do um, one more experiment, and that is one more kind of experiment where they, they biosynthetically radiolabeled um, the cells with tritiated glucosamine to see whether or not it was a glycoprotein in this area. And basically they had, a, it was the same kind of thing. They saw uh, a band at around 50,000 Daltons. So that's, uh, that's the extent of the um, of the data that they presented in this paper, so I'll stop the screen share here.
And um, so then in the, the discussion, they, 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 did a, they did other experiments. For example, they did, they radio labeled uh, TAC itself, the antibody, and then they did quantitative binding of anti-TAC onto the cells. The HUT-102 cells is what they used. And they found about 100,000 sites per cell. And they referenced our paper from the previous fall where we only found uh, around 10,000 sites per cell. So that was a major discrepancy that they couldn't account for and they, and they didn't know what that was all about. Um, but because of the fact that their antibody blocked radio label TCGF binding and blocked T cell proliferation and blocked the generation of cytotoxic T cells, and it also blocked the production of uh, immunoglobulin by human cells stimulated with pokeweed mitogen that was known to cause them to, to, for the B cells to make immunoglobulin. They figured that they had an antibody that was recognizing uh, the TCGF receptor. So that was how they concluded their, their paper. And so future stories, that subsequently what happened with this paper was it turns out that over the course of the next decade, it took a decade to really sort all of this, their, this particular paper's findings out. It took five more years to, to find out that there were at least two chains that would bind IL-2. One, and the TAC protein of 55 KD, 50, 55, and another protein that was um, 75 KD, 75,000 Daltons. And that ultimately became the beta chain. And then it took another five years until 1992 for the gamma chain uh, to be discovered. And we'll go through all those, those, those subsequent papers. But I think that the bottom line in this, in this particular paper is, is that these two papers, the first one on the TCGF binding assay, showed the way uh, for future people that were in, in, interested in interleukins and interleukin-2 receptors, to finally get um, to the identification of their receptor and then on from there to the um, uh, structure of the receptor at the protein level and at the genetic level by cloning the cDNA for, for the receptor. And this paper itself was the first paper that was had identified a monoclonal antibody reactive to at least a binding site uh, on, on the TCGF receptor. And, and this then therefore became prototypic for all the things that came afterwards and all the rest of the interleukins that were, had, that were discovered. And I think you, I may have mentioned that there were up to, nine, to number 43 or 44 at this stage of the game. The other, the other part of the story that I always, that, that um, uh, is a personal part of this story. So I, I did the initial experiments with the TCGF binding, which was crucial. If, if they hadn't been able to do that because, it, because the binding site, the binding assay had not been discovered yet or, you know, produced yet, they would have left, they would have been left with what they could do, which is what they did already in, uh, in this paper, which was to radio label the, the antibody and do binding of that. And then also radio label the cell surface or internally radio label the, the cells and do Im immunoprecipitation to find out how big it was. Um, but they wouldn't have known that it was really due to the receptor because they had needed the TCGF binding assay to, in order to figure that out. Well, so I did, I did a series of, of experiments and, and drew the figures and sent them the data early on, as soon as I had gotten back from Bethesda, and then I didn't hear from them for like months at a time and so forth, until finally after months went by, they sent me a draft of their paper and they say that they'd already submitted it to, the, to Nature. Now, I didn't think that was very nice of them. And they could have at least sent it to me before they submitted it. And, and also they could have told me about how, how they were doing it with the data and their experiments at that time. So obviously we became competitors and we were not collaborators from that point on. And, uh, and so there's, there's an ongoing saga, which is an old Norse word from, from the Vikings that says is that there's all kinds of ups and downs and ins and outs. Usually it's a, the saga is about a particular family uh, of Vikings
Uh, and so there's a saga that follows this whole business that we will get into later on as we go. So, um, so that's it. Um, uh, don't forget to like the video and click on the bell and check out the, uh, the website and um, come back next week. Thanks so much. It's been fun.